come back. We would like to uh, again thank Thales for sponsoring this afternoon's coffee break. Also, as a reminder, we would like to uh, encourage uh, you to be part of the discussion and uh, submit your questions to our uh, panelists uh, to the following email address, plenary underscore one at ikeo.int. This uh, second session uh, of the afternoon will address information management and it will be moderated, moderated by Mr. Jean-Francois Grou from IATA. Jean-Francois has over 30 years of experience in the aviation industry, particularly in the areas of air traffic management and the development of automation systems in support of en route and airport systems. He is currently the Assistant Director, ICAO Relations for IATA, and is IATA's nominated representative to the ICAO Information Management Panel, an advisor to the ICAO ATM Requirements and Performance Panel, and the RPAS Panel. He is also representing IATA in the ICAO UAS Advisory Group. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jean Francois Groux. Thank you, Frederic, for the nice words. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we've heard a lot before, you know, on how IQ is preparing aviation to digital identity, and thanks to the first framework. And let's now move, you know, to why they do that, you know, which is to exchange information. So hopefully this session will allow you to understand a bit better some of the challenges you know, that the US industry will be facing regarding information management. And those ranges from understanding what data inf and or information is required to support the safe and orderly management of US, where to find information, to how to exchange it, with whom, or how to ensure that the information comes from a trusted source. You know, the identity is just one aspect of that trust. And is it requested you know, by an authorized user? So as manned aviation is also about to embrace internet te technologies, you know, after, after all, you know, that coming to the modern age as well for the regular ATM, we were wondering you know, whether there could be opportunities to facilitate the exchange of information between the traditional airspace users and the US communities. So these are some of the issues that will be addressed during this session. But you're not here to listen to me, so let me introduce our speakers. The first speaker will be Steve Bradford, and Steve, if you don't know him already, is the FAA Chief Scientist for Architecture and Next Gen Development. He's the FAA lead, for the FAA NASA research transition team process to support collaboration between the FAA and the NAS on ATM-related activities. And a current focus of the RTT process is collaborations on both US in the NAS supporting vehicles operating in ATM and US traffic management supporting operations in uncontrolled airspace. The next speaker will be David Almeida, with Director, ATM Enterprise Integrations at LS Technologies. With nearly 30 years experience in technical and project management for software systems, IT infrastructure, cloud and networking technologies. David leads LST's effort in aligning aviation's operations and information technologies to business strategy, supporting cloud integrations of aviation systems. David is the SWIM Industry FAA Team Community Moderator working with airlines, airspace users, and the vendor community to create operational improvements towards modernization. The next one is Mark Kegelers. He's the chief executive officer of the Unify companies. And in fact, you, know, you already heard from Mark earlier today, and thanks again for, for the lunch, Mark. He holds a master degree in electronic engineering, a master degree in business administration, and he has a commercial pilot license, as well as an FAA private pilot license. Is also an experienced flight instructor. So prior to joining Unifly, Mark had a successful career in the IT and the aviation industry as a serial entrepreneur. Next one is 
and it's going to be a joint presentation. So I first introduce Maria Tam. She's currently the US project manager at the Estonian Air Navigation Services Provider and responsible for coordinating one of the CESAR SGU U-Space VLD projects called Gov Space U-Space, and you will hear more about that during the presentation. Her previous experience in aviation includes managing projects with a focus on human factors in air traffic control. She will be accompanied by Peter Cornelius, who is a graduate physicist. He is now a senior system architect with Frequency Comsoft, where he coordinates the UTM activities after 20 years with the company holding various positions from ATM automation department head to regional business development activity heads. And last but not least, Andreas Handy Lamprecht is the Chief Technology Officer at AirMap, the world's leading airspace management platform for drones. In his role, Lamprecht is responsible for the company's research and development roadmap, standardizations, and safety-related effort. Since starting at AirMap, Lamprecht has co-led the global development team for the companies from the company's European basis. And before joining AirMap, he spent a decade at Audi, helping shape the future of locations, mobility, autonomous driving, and high-definition maps, which I guess helps him in his new role at AirMap. So, with not, without waiting any further, I'd like to give the floor to Steve, who is going to take us through the UTM information architecture. Steve? Do you push or do I walk? Do I tell you when to switch or do I, does this work? Okay, then we'll switch the slide. Okay, I listened really carefully to the previous session and there was a lot of conversation about how complicated life is getting as we move forward. Um, my whole life I've spent trying to make things too simple, so let me make them a little too simple again. Uh, the importance of managing information for UTM operations is let's consider, let's consider up until we came along with UTM, what were the two forms of flight rules we had? We have VFR flight rules where a pilot read a book and then used his eyes and applied all that knowledge in his head. Then we had IFR in which a controller had a book with lots of rules and some paper which is called a flight strip and I don't care if it's electronic or otherwise, it's still a teletype message that's displayed somehow, and then they use voice. So I, had, I have two alternatives going forward with these new entrants. And we had the first new entrants came home from the war, and they wanted to fly 15,000 feet, and we said, no problem. They will be IFR. We will use paper and voice and have controllers talk to them. Then suddenly I had millions of little ones, and they go, oh, Paper and voice doesn't scale very well, and they have no eyes, so what am I gonna do? Now if you look at this slide, you won't see the words 400 feet or small UAS anywhere. It's describing an environment in which you have a community-based cooperative traffic management system where the operators are responsible for the coordination, execution, and management of operations within the rules of the road established by the FAA. Sounds like VFR, except no eyes. So you have to have a federated system that en enables the cooperative management of operations facilitated by third-party third su support providers through a network of information exchanges. I need to substitute lots and lots of good information for eyes because I'm not going to substitute lots and lots of information for paper strip and voice because I'm, no one's going to be talking. So what do we have to have with there? In this framework, it does present new challenges. You have to worry about security and authentication to guard against malicious activities. Phantom controllers are easy to pick out on the voice. Phantom pilots are easy to pick out on voice. When you deal with information only in a network, you can't have those physical cues anymore. So you have to be able to take care of that. You have to guarantee that the information Whole, has integrity from end to end. And this came up because my connection, my whole paradigm with voice and teletypes is that all my information was going on dedicated lines. 
And those are all going away. And I can't tell you how often the FAA gets a new letter from one of our providers that says, you know those links to that facility? They're going away. You're going to have to go to IP. And finally, everybody worries about these, for some reason, these things, because they fly at 400 feet, have cameras, and can look at things. So we need it, we need it to provide access to state, local, tribal, and federal entities in the United States so they can identify them. And you know, an N number just doesn't fit on a small drone. So we had to have this cooperative environment for information. And we want to leverage the International Aviation Trust Framework because I have to consider the integrity and I don't want to build a one-off. Next slide. So, just to point that out, we are trying to build something that's consistent with what you heard about in the previous section. We have to have a network, we have to share information, we need for that to be trusted because it's all IP, everything's going IP. Even, even and we're working on it with our datacom, our datacom is going IP from the old protocols. Okay, next slide. So, this is our notional architecture for UTM, it's been around, people have seen it for a few years. The emphasis here is on the right-hand side where all the responsibilities belong to the operator with the support of service providers. And if Rob Seegers is still here, they are not ANSPs. ANSPs, there's only one ANSP in the United States and that's on the left-hand side. But notice that the, the FAA shows a remarkably small footprint here because it's a cooperative community which shares information in order to manage the operation based on rules of the road. The FAA is not providing direct services, so the FAA exchanges information on the status of airspace and can ask for information when required. We have this lovely thing in the United States, uh, basically I forget the name of the act, but we're not allowed to collect information from people unless we're going to use it right away. And I'm not providing any services, so I'm not using the information right away. Therefore, it stays within that network. I can get it when I need to audit it, but I don't track every aircraft in the NAS. Next slide. So, here's all the information requirements and responsibilities. I don't expect you to read it, but I have about, I don't know, 25, 30 lines there. And you'll see two check marks in the far right hand column at the very bottom, and that's what the FAA provides to that network. The rest of this is the network providing it to the network so that UAS operators can operate. Um, they get their weather from service providers, they share information on BV loss. And this includes all the concepts, that, use cases that we see going forward. The emphasis here is it's on the USS operator and his U, UAS operator and his USS. This is a cooperative network. Therefore, in an IP world, therefore it needs to have all these characteristics. Next slide. Here's my part. I build a place where I interchange information, I have applications. Lance. Lance is our low, low altitude authorization notification. Uh, we allow Class B airspace to be treated like uncontrolled airspace below certain altitudes in Class B because our controllers don't operate manned aircraft there anyways. So if you follow some rules, we'll let you fly there. We used to have a website where you could apply for permission. That took us about 89 days, so okay. We worked with the community, come up with third party ways of them to support us. And with that, we're down to seconds. Unless you want something odd, then it goes, it gets bumped out to somebody else to review. We go on to seconds for minutes and days. So that's one of our paradigms. You'll see that in there. Um, another one is we don't want, we, we sometimes have um, state aircraft that need to operate, like in an accident. You need to have a medical evac helicopter come in. Manned aircraft, you can see the activity you keep away. Small drones, people who don't have eyes, need to be told that there's an activity. We, we proved out a case where the third parties could help define those and give them to us so we can help people keep away. So, 
I have a very thin set of things over on the far right, <laughs> backwards here, I'm sorry. Over the far, you'll see, my, you'll see all my databases. I have an aircraft registry, which the FAA, now that we require each individual aircraft to be registered, over time, we're going to get to a single registry for all aircraft, whether it's UAV or manned aircraft, traditional manned aircraft, even though they're growing up, UAVs are growing up to take over manned aircraft, and the pilot and everything else. And we'll have access through that. Next slide. So, this is not a pipe dream. We've tested this. We've had four tests with NASA where we've done them in various levels of, of uh, density and operations and sharing information. The last one was um, downtown Reno and also Corpus Christi. Um, we learned some things. Uh, we learned that Wi-Fi in a highly dense environment gets to be a little problematic, which was a, which was a positive result. We learned some things. Next slide. We've also done some things with, uh, the FAA has done some things with NASA. We've done something called UPP Phase 1, in which we worked with the industry to show how multiple people can share information, create information. Third parties can provide support to the FAA and to the UAS operators. This little pitch, uh, we're announcing Phase 2, also congressionally mandated, and we will be working at operations in high density, remote ID services, uh, flight information, and off-nominal UTM events. What happens if a, U, a UAS has a problem? How do, who do you have to notify? Uh, when do you have to notify ATM? Um, uh, hint, only notify them if they can do something. Uh, public safety operations, and then the volume reservations. Next slide. Now, not everything is known but it's still all information. Uh, in our concepts, you'll see we have two, two options here. This is for how does, how does law enforcement, how does the public find out information about that drone operating? In one environment, it's completely with the USSs, and you, that means that you have to have discovery, who's providing services in a location, then given they're providing services, are they managing the drones? What drones are they managing? And then how can law enforcement go get the information about that drone? Um, if it's, the question is, is do, can they get all the information from them that they need? Or do I have to go to option two where I have to get in the middle of all the law enforcement requests? And that's not something we really want to do. But this is all networked, no voice, has to be trust, and I bring up the law enforcement because just like a USS, a UAS to a UAS wants to be able to trust the information they're sharing with UAS, they'd also like to know that that person requesting information about them is authorized to get that information. So our certificates, our trust framework has to go well beyond just the vehicles into the public, into the, into the law enforcement community, and can they have access to that information? So, it's to reiterate, there is no voice, there is no books, there is no paper, it's all digital, it's all networks, it's all information, and we all have to trust it 100%. Thanks. Check, check, hey. Thank you, Steve, for that presentation. The next one is going to be David, which will be telling us how information management will support the U.S. integration. David? Thank you. Um, and I am really, really excited to be here. When I got the invitation, I was really, really excited. And I was really excited preparing for this. And then I got on the airplane yesterday and realized it is 70 degrees colder here than when I boarded that airplane yesterday in Orlando, Florida, and I was much less excited. Um, uh, I've been working with ATM modernization in a communications and information technology way for the last 15 years. And uh, I gotta tell you, I really am excited genuinely about the progress uh, and this conference in particular, because many of the things that we talked about relative to new entrants are becoming real. And they're becoming real in, in a very um, geometrically curved way. Um, 
And I'm excited about the UAS integration into the airspace system, and I think it's achievable through the use of information management. And I'm going to walk us through some of the issues, opportunities, and challenges ahead. Next slide. Let's establish a, a basic premise. The airspace is a system, and it's prone to hackers who want to do, uh, have uh, impact that system. So the question is, is this the face of an extremist? Meet Sylvia Dell. She's part of a movement called Heathrow Pause, who is using drones to disrupt flight operations as protests at Heathrow for the new uh, runway that's being built. Their mission is to ensure no aircraft flights will take place at Heathrow. Um, she believes it's safe, but is it? She has no professional training, no training at all on uh, UASs, and she's prepared to go to jail um, in order to fight her cause. So how do we assure safety, security, and economic viability of the ATM system given this kind of reality? Next slide. In terms of opportunities, technology evolution is changing the economic viability of everything. You look at NASA's cost per kilogram of um, uh, launching into space at $60,000 a kilogram, and the Falcon 9 is coming in at under $500. This fundamentally changes the economics of using different uh, volumes of airspace. Customers are starting to show preferences for drone delivery if it means they get their goods faster. And the Internet of Things are generating devices that will create immense amounts of data that will help predict behaviors, even with a safety-critical impact. Imagine, today, we have access to machine learning algorithms that are able to predict heart attacks four hours in advance of them occurring with 80% accuracy. Some of these applications have, um, uh, some of these have applications in aviation as well. Next slide. The airspace is a very precious and limited resource with new use cases popping up every day. Operations cross all airspace strata and require carefully coordinated access through each of them with various information needs within each of those strata. Our challenge is maintaining balance of capacity and demand in the ATM and manage the variability of each mission without impacting operations of any other mission. Next slide. And the missions vary dramatically. Uh, I was at the uh, Air Transportation Information Exchange Conference last month, and um, Greg Leon from MITRE introduced this picture. And, and I thought, you know, talk about a picture has a thousand words, right? Uh, it visualizes, I think, the scope of the problem very, very nicely. What you see is intersecting flight trajectories, crossing fur boundaries, different vehicles with different performance characteristics, airspace all of which have different constraints, restrictions, met implications. Information needs vary by mission across all of the different strata in the airspace. Next slide. Add to that complexity. Vehicles with extended range and duration are challenging legacy systems. For example, what does a flight plan look like for a vehicle that refuels in air and maintains a two-week duration flight? How about the Zephyr? Can you imagine what a flight data processor is ingesting in terms of a flight plan that looks like that? So there are some challenges that we're going to have to overcome by exchanging information. But first, I have a question for our panel. Do any of uh, my esteemed colleagues here have any idea of what the most successful hunter on Earth is? Anybody venture a guess? Any guess? A cat? Uh, I was thinking tiger or cheetah, right? No. Next slide. It is a dragonfly. It's amazing. Dragonflies um, have very, very large eyes characteristically. They have over 30,000 sensors in those eyes that allow them to actually spot dark against light background. That's why you see them um, hunt in certain parts of the day, and they hunt from low to high. They have the ability in a swarm of insects to uh, zero in on one prey, one single one, study it, and begin to predict its ability to maneuver in that airspace. They have these wings. These wings are incredible. They are four separate muscul um, um, musculature um, systems 
that operate independently of each other, so any one of those wings can move in any direction at any time. They calculate velocity for a perfect kill. Think about that. They geolocate. They calculate flight intent. They have the, the ability to predict what the other thing in the airspace is going to do. And then they have the ability to calculate how they can pursue that and get there with efficiencies of 95% or greater, better than any creature on the planet. And all of that in a dragonfly brain. Just amazing. Add to that their ability to um, have 300, almost 360 degree view um, allows them to see in all directions. Think of it in sense and avoid. So I was doing a little bit of research. I ran across a video and I just saw this really ultra slow motion video of a, of a uh, dragonfly flying off of a branch. And I thought, oh, isn't that beautiful? And within two frames, there's an enormous frog jumping at it, hands out, mouth open, swinging and missing. So that same ability to see helps protect them as well. So how do, what does that have to do with uh, anything associated with uh, UASs? Next slide. Because our ATM systems have to be capable of achieving a similar level of adaptability in near real time. UAS transforms standard ATM processes. These are digital workflows. UAS operations are envisioned to be highly automated Steve kind of went through exactly, it's machine to machine. You saw that, that heavy uh, dependency on the right hand side of that UTM architecture. Um, these are highly modernized. These are digital workflows. They've never had paper before. And they're integrating in traditional ATM processes that are digitizing workflows, not necessarily digitally transforming them. Let me give you an example. Look at charts. Moving from paper to EFBs, very, very valuable, make no mistake. However, are we integrating the related digital data that transforms actual decision making into the decision support tools? Information is the gateway to be able to do that, and it's got to be integrated, and that requires interoperability. Interoperability across an integrated architecture that transcends the, the technical, the business, and the application level architectures. Next slide. And I know, you're gonna say, Dave, standards take care of interoperability for us, don't they? Well, it turns out, if many of you have, may have seen the picture there in the uh, background on the right, and every time I, oh, my right, uh, every time I uh, show that picture, I show the one in front of it. There are multiple technology layers, each of which having their own protocols. And it's important to start lining up those standards across every technology layer. Otherwise, you have the ability to be standards compliant and not able to talk from one application to the other. So these things are absolutely critical in the information exchange between systems. And technology can help. In the information management panel, we discuss SWIM, service orientation, and the importance of the data supply chain, linking that to message exchange patterns on information type and relating to op, uh, the operational processes they, they, they participate in. For example, the, uh, Steve mentioned remote ID or, or um, identifying uh, drone pilots. Um, there are static messages that come from that and dynamic messages. So in event-driven architecture, there's a concept called eventing. And eventing allows business architects to sequence information exchanges with workflows and integrate them into business processes. These are how these things all kind of connect. And emerging technologies appear promising as well, using microservices. I mentioned the predictive analysis uh, capabilities of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and open algorithms. And please, somebody ask a question about open algorithms. There's a ton on that. Next slide. Another use case, uh, the UTM case, and this is the slide that you just saw from Steve and just putting into a little bit of context. Could this be implemented as a microservice? How can data and the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning type of um, capabilities begin to help us predict the consequences of non-conformant users? How can we get as smart as a dragonfly? But these four points at the top of the chart um, synthesize the foundational elements for UAS ATM integration using information. Number one, SWIM is greater than data exchange. It is the enabler for integration. Number two, we have to transform the legacy air, trans, uh, air, trans, air traffic management system. 
It's not good enough to just recreate processes with digital products that were once paper. We have to integrate that data into the decision support tools. But beware, more data doesn't necessarily mean better decisions. I hear Steve Bradford say it all the time. We're drowning in data, but we're, we're thirsty for information. Next slide. So let's go back to our dragonfly. Turns out, alas, disaster. Our dragonfly wasn't aware of the performance characteristics of a vehicle operating in a stratum. I mean, who would have approved a, four, a high velocity four wheel vehicle um, to operate in the same space, same stratum as a dragonfly's flight path? That's just irresponsible. But this proves that security is safety critical and trust matters. Decision makers have the, um, have, must have the information they need, when they need it, and where they need it. Automation requires real-time information exchanges and SWIM helps deliver that through information services. However, the payload has to be, um, the data quality has to be verified by the producers and the consumers need to understand what they're using for intended use. And that's why I applaud the efforts of the Trust Framework Study Group, which are critical in establishing policies, governance, and standards for trusted exchange from the manufacturer to the tactical operations and even post-ops analysis. Last slide. So what about Sylvia Dell and the folks at uh, Heathrow Paws? Um, are they ecological warriors or maybe economic terrorists? Um, I think their cause is noble, make no mistake, but their methods could be irresponsible and even endanger the public. But the airspace system, drones introduces um, a, a mechanism for new attack vectors on the airspace system. And these are some of the key data elements that we have to exchange in a trusted way to successfully integrate UAS into ATM, flight intent, airspace restrictions, conformance, deviations, and all the reporting associated with that. And remember that a terrorist doesn't have to bring down an aircraft to sow distrust in flying. All they really have to do is create some random events that demonstrate instability in the ATM system. That'll yield, uh, that'll lead to economic terror in aviation. And it falls upon us to integrate UCS, uh, UAS and keep that trust in the ATM. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for the presentation. Our next, the next speaker is going to be Mark, showing us what are the actors involved in providing information for UTM. Mark? Um, good afternoon again. Um, first of all, I all owe you a, a big apology. Uh, I promised Belgian fries. I promised Belgian waffles. And it didn't happen, much to my surprise. Apparently, there was a logistical hiccup. Might have been the snow but we didn't really get what we wanted. But at least we got the steel. Okay. Um, what I want to do in this uh, brief presentation is uh, to give you a feel of how complex uh, information management can become. Next slide. Uh, the model that I want to use is a generic uh, UTM model. Uh, obviously, it has, says Unifly in, in the middle. This is the cloud that you know, it could represent a centralized UTM system or a federated system. Typically, uh, in such an environment, on the left side, you have users, uh, drone users, uh, with, uh, let's say, maps on, on websites or apps where they can, do, they can do flight planning and do flight approval requests. And on the, on the right side, you would have uh, national ANSPs, national CAAs, or, or even, even local authorities to do uh, flight monitoring, uh, to do flight approvals, uh, and do registration activities. And on the bottom side, you would have uh, connectivity to, 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 to drones for tracking or even issuing commands to drones. What I want to emphasize on, on this presentation is the top section. Um, and we start from the right to left. Typically, a, uh, uh, say a UTM system would at least want to be connected to an ATM system using SWIM interfaces. So typically, Asterix and AXM in, uh, uh, data. You would also want to connect to uh, a source of weather data, GIS data, so any data that you can think of uh, that can be described or linked to a geographical position. And what you also need is a database of the regulations of the national, 
local or regional regulations so that with all that data, all that data in the system, you can determine if a drone is, to be, uh, is supposed to be at a certain location, yay or nay. And you can do that before the flight, during the flight, or even after the flight. Next. The example that I want to give is an implementation that we actually did uh, in Germany. Uh, and this is one uh, of our screens, the, the, what we call the flight view screen. Visible, yeah. uh, the flight view screen, which will allow you to visualize uh, all of the data uh, into the system. This is how it looks like clean. And on the top right bottom, you have this sort of envelope type of thing. If you click on it, you get this. Next slide. You get a list of all of the data that you could visualize on that screen or that you could use to determine if a flight is to happen, yay or nay. Now, the only section that was uh, crossed there was uh, current operations. There are no current operations, so that, that's easy. Next slide. This is something that you will recognize. This is typically we uh, connected uh, or we uh, dotted the control zones in public or military airports. And there, for, for people that know Germany a bit, there you will see the contours of the uh, Frankfurt airport, plus the control zones around it. And on the right top side, you have a, a small airport. So this is typically the AXM data uh, that we saw some you know, official databases that we put in the system. And uh, behind that, obviously, is the legislation that thou shalt not fly in those areas without approval. Next slide. Ah, it becomes more interesting. There is a regulation in Germany that says thou shalt not fly a drone over populated areas without an approval. Then you have to know where the populated areas are. These are them in the vicinity of Frankfurt. That's a lot. Next slide. Ah, sensitive fauna. There's a regulation in Germany that says thou shalt not fly a drone over sensitive uh, fauna without permission. So that's where they are. Again. Next slide. Boom. And now we have industrial sites. Thou shalt not fly in industrial uh, drones over an industrial site without the permission. So we can see that the more you build up the data, the more complex it becomes. Now, granted, there's a reason why I use this example. Uh, Germany is, uh, from a regulatory point of view, a quite a complex uh, regulation, but it's also very densely populated and with a big industrial buildup. So that's when, when you get these things. And I have not crossed everything. In, in Germany, we have 25 different sets of data that we can use or must use to determine if a drone is supposed to fly somewhere. Yeah or nay. So for an individual drone user to start to evaluate where he can fly yes or no without a tool like this is not really possible. Next slide. So the point that I want to make is uh, if you build the UTM system, there's a big probability that you will need a number of data layers uh, to make things happen. Next slide. First question is, you know, which data? Which, is all, which are all the data sets that I will use in the UTM system? Shall I use open source data? Maybe, that's probably uh, pretty cheap, but we all have been there when we have a GPS with open source data and we drive around with our car that we sometimes end up in places where we don't really want to end up. So open source has its advantages, but also disadvantages. Are we then better with certified data? Maybe yes, maybe no. What level of certification? Who does that certification? We don't know. What is the quality of the data that goes into the system? Who will certify that? Who will verify the quality of the data? Uh, now, small parenthesis here. Uh, we have implemented UTM systems in Germany and Belgium to uh, two countries that are next to each other. Um, and strange enough, uh, and we've used, uh, let's say, the uh, official data from official sources to determine where the border of, between Belgium and Germany is. 
strange enough, those two data sets were different. In some cases, Belgium had taken a part of Germany, and in other places, Germany had taken a part of Belgium. So even with official data sources, you, you, you are not guaranteed that all the data is correct. What about data integrity? And that really is in, in, in line with all the discussions here. Once the data is in the system and gets shared with other UTM systems, yeah, how can we be certain that that data has, let's say, stays the way it should be, that the quality of that data is not compromised? Yeah. Uh, again. Okay, then, okay, who's going to procure that data? Who's going to make that data? Are you, do you want to you produce your own data or you, do you want to buy data? Next. As a conclusion, yeah, sourcing data is going to be an issue for anyone that wants to build a good UTM system. It can be potentially very complex, um, but there are a number of uh, parameters there that will define you know, what data that you want. The regulation, uh, all of the, let's say, the, the, the number of uh, data sources and number of data layers in Germany is about 25 because of the regulation. Other countries have a lot less data. It's because of the regulation that defines what data you need or not. And that's not aviation regulation. It's usually it's local regulators that will define what needs to be done yesterday. The type of flight, uh, is it something that is uh, flown visually, visual line of sight, or BVLOS, it will determine a lot. And then also the level of automation, because all of this data, we have now visualized it on a map, but all that data will need to be uh, available as well for uh, automated systems that drive the drones. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So the next speaker is, in fact, two speakers. So I will now ask Peter and Maria to give us an example of how to manage information for UTM through a real case. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to have an invitation to this um, distinct location, to this distinct panel. Um, we're trying to be uh, a bit more specific in, in this particular one. We've heard now about um, uh, a lot of uh, different approaches to it, so I'm trying to be reporting uh, specifically about a project that we have executed in Europe. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, I'm reporting about the, uh, together with Ma Maria, we're reporting about the Gulf of Finland Youth Space Project. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the CESAR validation exercises um, that uh, we implemented in the countries of Finland and, uh, and Estonia. We set out, we set out to uh, integrate ATM and UTM across countries across agencies, even across industry areas. Um, key to the success of the project was to really establish an operational, common operational picture for all parties involved, to really get the data, gather the data, turn it into information and display it in an appropriate way, deliver it in an appropriate way to all parties involved. And this really facilitated all of the joint operations that we had in mind and the um, collaboration between the authorities. Um, to that end, we formed a very large consortium, part, part uh, ANSPs, part UTM service providers, industry operators, infrastructure, um, all of them in the same project. And what did we do? Um, we ran through seven uh, use cases. Uh, one of them is op was operating um, with uh, um, drones in an urban environment, with police intervention, so really um, an ac interactive case. We were flying in a very close, um, um, close dense airspace with uh, drones, model aircraft, general aviation. Um, that was quite exciting to see all of them in the air. Maritime search and rescue exercise, drones, vessels, uh, helicopters operating in the same area over sea. We had an international parcel delivery in international airspace from Tallinn to the vicinity of Helsinki um, uh, operations in the control area uh, of the um, Tallinn airport, forestry inspection and even an air mobility flight. In order to implement um, this um, 
this project, we decided right from the start to implement a central flight information management system, a FIMS, and we chose to do so based on SWIM concepts. Next one, please. So this is the architecture that we have come up with. Um, to its design, SWIM concepts and uh, CSR principles are fundamental. <clears throat> the setup facilitated and actually operated in two different countries, so we have the FIMS to FIMS communication. Um, we also found out for our project in our context that uh, we wanted to have some, what I call, sort of foundation services in the FIMS providing uh, the um, shared situation awareness, for instance, the positions um, to everybody uh, on, on a uh, central basis. However, it was also crucial to everybody involved to delegate as much of the services to the UTM environment as was possible. And we spent a good time to standardize the services that we needed to do so. Um, and as a result, we have uh, an architecture that is now forming part of the European set of architectures that there are. Now, what did we do? We had the service oper um, the, um, uh, the operators, we had um, the service providers and all of them in one place, and we really looked uh, into what did the operators want to achieve when operating um, their devices, um, what's their concerns and what are things that they can't be really be ch uh, in charged with um, or would be overloaded by. Um, we established a common understanding. We looked into where did the data came from, where do we have to send it, um, how, what did we have to do it and to turn it into information. We um, agreed on a context, on data models on uh, which data had to go through which interface um, and um, uh, defined the behavior of it all. And we did so uh, in a technology agnostic way so everybody would be on the same page. And we did so first. And out of this we deliver as part of the project, and that will be published then through CESAR in the, in the near future, um, specifications for telemetry, flight plans, uh, geofences and AM. Uh, alerts, uh, registration. We also had one for ground station uh, um, uh, implementation, but uh, we were not able to finish that in the short, uh, short time frame that we have. And then we took a second step and actually went to see into the uh, look into the um, interfaces and how we would uh, implement it. And I think this ties in what we had heard before. And um, this is actually an advantage with the approach that we did. We, we agreed on, on the data that we, that we would like to transfer, not necessarily on the specifics of an interface. And um, we agreed on the data, and that enabled us, can we have the next one, please? Um, that enabled us to, um, um, to cater for sort of you um, NASA um, FAA type interfaces on one hand, uh, European U-space space type interfaces on the other hand, um, even vendor specific interfaces, and we were able through the central FIMS to really interoperate this data and keep everybody on the same page. Um, and we ensured that including the, the conventional interfaces, we, we heard already the keyword asterisks here, we all trace them to the same specification. So um, the information we, we were sharing was, uh, was actually shareable. As a result, next one please. As a result, the specification, this is an example for the, um, for the, uh, um, um, for the telemetry, was, was stable throughout the project. And I, I think this is, this is special. Um, and we can still continue to evolve the specification. It's, uh, it doesn't really matter which technology we were changing on, on the way or whether we have different implementations. We're able to actually um, interconnect despite of the different uh, technologies that we have. So this is, this is quite, I think, an advance. Um, and the next one, looking into other services, um, part of the flight information system is a means 
to the, where, where consumers, data consumers, information consumers and providers actually can find each other and that's the service registry. So the service registry defines a clear responsibility for the service type and for a region. Uh, and along with uh, with, the, with the service specification, you can de define the quality of data and then establish a, a, a clear uh, understanding of what you deliver. And we just heard about how crucial this is. Um, <clears throat> and the actual uh, information comes then out of the um, out of the information service that is related with it. Um, and since the um, the consumer then talks to the to the data provider to the information provider directly, you can um, uh, you know the quality that you receive, um, you know that that's your source of truth, your single source of truth, and you ensure that you receive the data in a timely manner. Now um, I hand over to Maria. What else did we receive? Uh, what did we learn from the project? Please. Thank you, Peter. So a little bit um, insight into uh, practical experience, uh, how it really looked uh, like when we did the trials and uh, what the uh, previously described uh, use-based architecture implementation really looked like. So some, um, some conclusions. So we were able to uh, support quite complex trials as described before. Uh, to enable the use space uh, services uh, um, mostly on U2 level, uh, but also uh, on U3 level, like uh, dynamic geofencing uh, that we demonstrated. Uh, in several trials, we showed uh, how public authority, in this case uh, police, set up a dynamic um, a geofence when uh, operators were in flight and uh, how the operators were able to respond and depending on the level of uh, integration it was done uh, automatically by a drone activating the uh, return to uh, launch mode. Uh, in addition we um, achieved the common um, uh, situational picture uh, as uh, the flight and surveillance information uh, was um, received from duplicate ATM systems and it really enabled to provide um, uh, the overview of uh, manned aviation activity in the trial area. So for the most trials we really had the overview of uh, both where drones were flying and, um, and, uh, on, and manned aviation aircrafts if they were necessary. Uh, for us to observe. For example, when we were flying in uh, control airspace in the vicinity of airport up to uh, 2200 feet, it was also relevant for us to know about the manned aircrafts. And also when uh, the project um, participated in maritime search and rescue exercise, where rescue helicopter was involved and also unexpected uh, HEMS uh, flight occurred during the trial into the uh, area. Uh, this information was um, uh, providing this uh, situational awareness. Uh, we were able to um, integrate several different systems and where flight plans were submitted in one of the systems, in one of the platforms, uh, these were uh, accepted in other platforms. We were also able to uh, uh, demonstrate an in-flight uh, operation plan uh, change. This also occurred during the uh, search and rescue exercise. A drone doing a search exercise received new tar uh, target coordinates in-flight and changed the flight plan accordingly. And also the current information was uh, uh, displayed when um, we had the registry as a repository, part of uh, FIMS, and when we made uh, before trial slight um, changes, um, these all were immediately available for the trial. The next slide. Uh, how did the um, 
accurate information uh, look like during the trials. So the drones provided um, uh, position reports from multiple sources. And these multiple uh, data sources were combined and fused um, uh, for tracks in, in the FIMS. As these trials uh, took place mostly in uh, temporary, segregated, restricted, or um, danger, danger areas, we used the uh, AIM data so that everyone had the exact same overview of uh, the flight uh, geography and the reserved airspace. In addition, we used the mul multiple layers of safety. We had the um, additional uh, ATM grade safety net uh, set up for monitoring uh, compliance with the flight geography, especially in the controlled airspace. Uh, and in some of the cases, we really received uh, conflicting alerts when one of the drones was uh, exiting uh, or uh, taking up altitude and uh, action was uh, uh, taken after receiving such notifications. Um, however, the lessons learned also uh, indicate that uh, f further work is uh, definitely needed, uh, especially when uh, we talk about uh, telemetry data and, and trackers and um, what are the reliable sources for, uh, for position reporting and also what to do when there's a poor mobile network uh, available. And also, what about the non-AIP grade information? If you don't have the database of uh, restriction areas, uh, uh, where to fly, where not to fly, what uh, what to do then. So everybody have um, a similar information, but again, it's slightly different. But when we are talking about the safety area around the airports, it should be exactly the same in in uh, for for everyone. So indeed, we uh, we. Um, we had the standard uh, protocols for information exchange and uh, it required really a considerable effort from all the parties uh, involved to integrate uh, into this UTM um, uh, system because every system, uh, every platform has its own workflows and uh, guiding principles. So these standard protocols uh, are, are required um, I would say, to enable a common uh, situational pic picture, common information, uh, to really ensure, ensure that uh, the information uh, shared is of right quality and uh, provided at the right time, delivered to, uh, to the right place. But still, uh, further work is, is needed, especially um, uh, these workflows need to be included in uh, service specifications uh, when we talk about complex uh, UTM service provision, like, for example, operation plan management. Okay. So, and to conclude, uh, this is a um, picture from a drone wing camera from the international flight um, that um, was of distance around 90 kilometers. It took um, around uh, one hour and 10 minutes for the drone to uh, fly from Estonia uh, to Finland. And um, uh, if we take a look, if, if it's uh, uh, visible, on the left side, we really see that uh, the, the common uh, operational picture was really shared between different uh, platforms. And this flight was invisible, uh, invis visible uh, and observed uh, in, in both the UTM system and also in the ATM system. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's very good you know, to see some examples of how data can be used and, and shared. 
uh, Andy is the last one uh, for today, and he will be providing another view of information management for UTM. Andy? Thank you very much, and uh, I'm delighted to say that um, at least from the USS service provider side, there seems to be a, a, a drive to converging of requirements, and uh, you'll, you'll see some of that in the upcoming slides now because um, we happen to have been participating in this project that was just uh, uh, explained by uh, Maria and by Peter, uh, as did the Unifly. And so the sharing of information between service providers is actually one of the core information needs of UTM. Um, in the upcoming slides, though, I will speak uh, more about the need for information from the authoritative side. And so that's, that's what the... The presentation will be about. So let's um, let's have a look. Next slide, please. I'm going to rush through the first one because I think you have. Uh, I can keep going. You have a fairly good understanding in the audience what uh, UTM service providers are doing. Um, high level, we provide services on the one side to those who manage the airspace, and then on the one side to those who operate in the airspace, and they need to be somehow connected. And here's the version of the diagram that has AMRAP in the middle, but uh, it's not, not that important. Um, next slide, please. It can get fairly complicated in terms of what products are created. And, and I just made a list here. So it's products for authorities for, that manage the airspace, but also other authorities, for instance, firefighters or police brigades, uh, enterprises who are using the airspace for inspection services uh, of, of all sorts and kinds, uh, enterprises who do drone delivery programs, uh, service providers uh, who uh, then provide this to other consumers in the end, um, and of course, people that operate drones. So um, it, it's a, a lot of different types of products that are uh, thinkable of, or that we can think of, and they all come with different challenges. And um, uh, I want to talk about one specific one that Mark also touched upon. As a drone pilot, I want to know, is it legal to fly in the location that I want to carry out my operation or not? Um, actually, that was the question we were all having in like 2017. Now it, it's much more a conditional question because it, it usually, even if it's not legal to fly somewhere, there are always ways of getting authorizations because you might be a user that actually has a good reason for doing that. And so that's one of our products. We want to provide a simple interface for drone operators to know I can fly here or I have to do this and that to take off and be compliant with the law. Next slide, please. Well, here's the problem. This is uh, an article. Uh, just put a screenshot here. It's specific to the US, but it's really the same problem that Mark was describing earlier. There are um, regulations in place, and they don't necessarily are limited to only aeronautical data. So you have um, this whole domain of information management from the traditional aviation space, uh, and there are standards around it and existing systems that work, and uh, some countries have put um, procedures in place where also um, um, the performance requirements are really specified really well. Um, the FAA, for instance, has a, a, a LANS program um, um, where you can uh, provide authorizations to people who want to use airspace, uh, controlled airspace in, in this specific case. Um, and they also have a, a partnership with a company that provides this exact function of telling operators, is it legal to fly here or not? Well, the problem is there's, lo there's lots and lots of data involved that is not necessarily provided uh, by the aviation administration in this case. For instance, national parks or um, um, uh, counties that uh, restrict the takeoff and landing rights of drones. Or uh, in Germany, the uh, famous uh, waterways and highways and, and water patrol areas. So it, it creates a massive confusion because even though if you try to fly exactly compliant to the law, you often can't it and it even becomes more and more of a problem once you move into more autonomy because then you, you don't necessarily have an operator who can look at 20 different websites to understand the problem. We want to have this digital, digitally available 
and understandable by a, a computer in the end. So, um, we looked at the uh, famous um, various versions of the UTM notional architectures that exist. This specific one is from Switzerland. It's kind of the same that the FAA has been just showing. Um, they all look kind of the same. Yeah? We have different service providers and sometimes there's multiple ones of them, sometimes there's only one. Uh, you have this uh, thing called FIMS or, or uh, um, uh, Flight Information Management System. And we thought together with our partners there, well, how would this ideally look like in a federated UTM model such that we solve the problem of UTM service providers being in need of all sorts of data who is on the other side created by many different authorities that have a inherent legal right to update this data as well and have control over it and also have control about the exceptions to those, in, in most cases we're talking about no-fly zones, right? So have control about the exceptions of what they would approve in those no-fly zones. So in the, um, um, in this case, in the Swiss UTM CONOPS, the, the FIMS in its current version is limited to a, a set of, of features um, that basically allow a, a decentralized, federated, multi-authority uh, UTM model with authority oversight. And so that's, that's what we did, and I'm gonna show the, the individual capabilities. Um, maybe before we do that, it, it's, I think it's important to understand that the, this is not one box that someone operates and then has all the responsibilities with it. it it's really a, a set of capabilities that also many different parties can operate, and they can even be multiple ones in a country and however, they need to be somehow orchestrated. So there could be, uh, you know, one, one part uh, uh, of, um, of the country who's managed by that central distribution function and then another part of the country who is operated by a different one. Um, it, it, it's, it's more about what the data needs are and how they are satisfied for the USPs. So if we have a look in, in more detail, it, it's really just four different capabilities. Um, so on the left side, you have kind of the, the national level authorities. So in most cases, that's gonna be an ANSP and the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, in many countries, there will be a registration system attached to that. And very happy to hear the advancements that, uh, that we're making here to get this standardized. And then um, on the far right side, you have the service providers, the USPs who, as I said earlier, are, are providing services either to operators but also to authorities. Now, what, what do they need? They need, in our view, four different things. The first one is, uh, has to do with authentication. So we need to know, you know what are the services that are available, how can we get um, authorized for accessing them, what's the data that we need, uh, how often do we need to update it, and that's a combination of a, a web API and a set of rules that explains how this works. And we call this, in this case, service registry trust store. So really, it, it's, it's a PKI infrastructure that works on OAuth and provides you with tokens to access different services. Then the next one is called operations. So that's um, currently a, a, an area of, of investigation and work. The idea is, if you need to get authorization to fly somewhere for your specific operation, then in the case of FAA lands, you have to ask the FAA because it's you know, the airspace and their system. Well, what if your operation overlaps with FAA airspace, but also the National Park Service and maybe whatever, 10 other things that are restricted? Maybe the US is the wrong example in this case, but there are many, many different countries on the planet and they have very different rules. And so this is a completely existing use case that as a drone operator, I might need to, to coordinate with five or six different authorities to get my flight approved. So we've created this system that basically acts like a directory of who you need to ask to get this authorization. 
So on the one side, the authorities would register themselves. They would say, okay, I'm authority national park. Here's my jurisdiction. This is what I uh, have, uh, uh, have a say off in terms of who flies there and maybe at what time or, or in what conditions. And then on the other side, we have the USPs that would submit the uh, flight plans to this operation service, and then it would distribute it to the authorities uh, who are in charge of that. There's different alternatives of doing that, but that's currently what we're trying to experiment with. Uh, tracking uh, has a lot to do with uh, real-time data exchange between, on the one side, drone telemetry information, so real-time position on drones that might be necessary for some authoritative use cases to receive. Um, could be some flavor of remote ID where some countries are mandating or some specific situations where it's, where it's mandatory to provide this information under certain use cases. Um, but also it, it's, it's also the other way around. So we have the ANSP connected on the left side and all the information about where manned aviation traffic is in the sky is tremendously important for USPs because uh, according to most flight rules in most countries, the drones have to give a right of way to the, to the manned aviation participants. So it's kind of important to know where they are. And uh, typically ANSPs have a fairly good picture of surveillance of the airspace. So this system enables this data exchange in both ways. And then we have geography, which is really the, the data repository for all the flight restrictions and the rules associated with it. And, and again, you know, this could be not necessarily a one-to-one -one connection. There could be n different ones on the left side and then a whole set of USPs on the right side. So um, almost last slide, the question is, that's a lot of functions and a lot of authorities involved. Well, how do we get this standardized? Um, I guess it's, it's not standardized today, but there are a lot of existing standards that we can leverage for this. Uh, on the aviation side, there's a lot of um, things already existing in the context of SWIM. So data format or, or, or uh, data uh, met methods for pushing data between different entities uh, are definitely something that, that can work here. Uh, there is um, existing standards in the IT world that we can leverage, like uh, open authentication or digital identity exchanges. Um, for the operations and op authorization service, we uh, have uh, uh, all sorts of systems that are in operation already. Um, we have an ASTM remote ID standard now that, that specifies this. We have lots of work in the NASA UTM project that specifies this. Uh, we even could take over some of this in the European U space uh, uh, program so that it's not too diverse. And by the way, I completely agree with Peter's message. It, it's, uh, you know, if you really want to make this work, we shouldn't really wait for, you know, one data field or the other one to be standardized. And, and maybe this takes five years because it's fairly easy from an IT software perspective to create a translation layer and then just do it. So the overall message is that we don't have to actually wait that long. There's a lot of uh, standards available. And if we collaborate and make it open, I, I think there's lots of advantages for all players and stakeholders that are involved. And, uh, and we have a fairly good uh, possibility of getting UTM out in the field of operation in an orchestrated way, in a higher quality manner, much earlier. So in conclusion, you know, the, the message should be the, 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 the message is there's tremendous data needs for having compliant and, uh, and, uh, and quick ways of determining where you can fly and how you can fly there. And if USSs provide those types of services, they need access to a lot of data. Um, and it's in most countries not the case that there's just one authority and then they provide all the data that you need for making this distinction, most countries have a legal system where it's a multi-authority environment, and it works. I mean, in Europe, we have how many ANSPs? 32 something? Um, and and uh, it's not a new problem, right? This, this works. And so uh, if we work together on uh, 
uh, this data sharing capability between the different service providers, but also between the service providers and the authorities. I think this is one of the key elements for solving the information needs in the drone economy. Thank you very much. So thanks, Andy, for the, um, the presentation. So that, that's the end of the presentation part. Uh, I have already a few questions, so that, that's good. But you know, to give you time maybe to bring or provide additional questions, I have two on my own um, that I like to, to throw to the group. Um, one, in fact, is a reaction to uh, some of the presentations, uh, maybe the one on my left side further. Um, because you, know, you mentioned the use of AIM data. And as you know, you know, AIM was defined initially and is defined today you know, for manned aviation. So the question is, you know, is it fit for purpose? You know, is it something that you can use as it is? Or because of, let's say, the specificities of UAVs, you might need some adaptations to that. Does anyone want to give it a thought? Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we use the AM data specifically to get the, the data from the manned aviation into the UTM system. Uh, because that's you know the, that's what the 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 drone user will want to know where are the CTRs where is control airspace um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then obviously you have to enrich that with with much much more data. So only the AAM data is not enough. AAM data is one set of data that we that we use, and we pull that from certified sources. Okay, there are sources uh, in the world that you know, that provide open source. Uh, supposedly good uh, aviation data, the specific AAM data we we, we pull from for certi certified sources. Peter, you want to add something? Yes. Ah. Uh, yes. Um, on the, um, I, I would even take it a bit further. Uh, if we look at the flight plans as we currently sp uh, specify them, um, the degree of detail that we can enter into them. Uh, just looking at the positions as we currently specify them are way too inaccurate for the detailed area of operation that we've got drones in. So there's a lot of things that we should consider, and, and the same applies to AM, AM data. It's okay for, um, for, for us in aviation, for commercial aviation, because of the relatively large separation even on reduced separation, we fly relatively large separations, but on, on drones we don't have that and we need to go into much more detail. And the question really is where do we require, it? Where do we require this information? The, the key is uh, to identify um, who is going to provide it and what, uh, at what uh, sort of authority level and so on. So um, yes, to agree, um, this is a restricted airspace. What we currently have is, way, uh, is sufficient. If we are talking about individual op obstacles or individual flight channels also, um, then we will probably want to reconsider eventually and add more data sources. Okay. Andy? I, I want to make a bit more provocative statement. I, say, I would say AIM is not fit for purpose. There is, um, I give you two examples. One is the um, zoom level. So we have, for instance, all sorts of maps that we need to ingest provided by the FAA authoritative source uh, for providing the, the lens capability to, the, to our own system and then eventually to the operators. And um, you can see that in those maps that are used in AIM, they are sometimes based on you know, just old printed maps that you know, maybe there's a circle and then another circle here. Now, if you import this in a digital up-to-date system and you zoom in, you somehow see that it's not a circle, it's like a polygon and it looks kind of odd and there's a space in between. But that's exactly the operating distance that a drone would have, right? It's maybe it only flies 300 meter. So we, we, we need better, better maps for this use case. And, and, and the other problem is, even if you use certified sources, um, for instance, for runways, perfect. But then if the law says you have to keep 1.5 kilometers distance to those runways, well, you create a software that has some algorithm that now creates a buffer from the runway to the 1.5 kilometer, no longer certified, right? There could be all sorts of mistakes that you make in this calculation. So AIM doesn't, doesn't uh, it's, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's not solving the problem. 
Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, it, I, yeah. I want to compliment that. Yeah, a, a, AM is, is not for fit per person as is, but you have to put additional uh, information with it. Uh, it's not enough to just put a, a chart with, you know, these are the CTRs and this is B-class airspace. The drone user says, so what? Uh, there's a regulation and then the, that then defines in this type of zone, you can this, this and this and that. So the AM data in itself, I agree, is not fit per, fit per purpose, but you can make it fit per purpose when you add additional information to it. Thank you. So now I move to the questions because I'm starting to get quite a few. So I will read the first one because it's a bit long and I don't want him to misread it. So it says, if UTM, and that's probably for, I don't know who is going to answer that one, so pay attention, it might be any one of you. <laughs> if UTM is a community-based cooperative traffic management system where operators are responsible for the coordination, execution, and management of operations, how can you ensure scalability? Most demonstrations in the US and Europe have used a limited number of drones with a small number of operators and service providers who agreed beforehand to work together. Given GPS uncertainties in urban airspace and problems with a common height reference and so on, are you certain that a cooperative system can remain safe and effective with a large number of different drones with other competing operators and service providers? So who wants to have a kick at that one? <laughs> Steve. <laughs> okay, so. The, the question is, can you have a cooperative system? This is on, this is on. Okay, can you have a cooperative system? Because we have bad data, that's what they say. And, uh, and I think the other point is, you know, if you increase the number of operators, is so it still I, I viable? Think, so, yes, we've done demonstrations. We've only scaled it. You're right, 20, 30 vehicles, can we scale up? Yes, because um, you only have 20 or 30 vehicles in any small piece of airspace. I don't, if I even had 10,000 of them in a, in a metropolitan area, they're still not gonna be that close together. So the question being is, can I have a reliable set of information that, about where these vehicles are? Uh, GPS does have problems, so if, if we go beyond visual line of sight, we will most likely, and I almost can guarantee, will require you have a backup, secondary backup, so you can have the resiliency and the accuracy. It's not GPS only. Um, the rules will build upon themselves. If you're looking at what's required for a visual line of sight, it's pretty, it's pretty sloppy. But then you're not supposed to get more than 400, 500 feet from the operator, and it's all in the operator. As you scale up, the performance of the vehicle has to go way up, including height, including geofencing, including accuracy, or they will not be able to fly in those environments. So we will specify a performance based on the type of operation. Now, I also, and my, my dear friend Jared's out there, he was, he was a sometimes regulator, and he's having fun, but I do believe that we, can, we will specify a level of performance in an environment commensurate with the density of the traffic. And if you're a sloppy user of airspace, because you don't have the accuracy, you may not be able to fly certain times of day. So I think from my, my beginning rule from day one is, we specify that the, the type of your access to the airspace is based on a level of performance, which we will specify. And if you can't achieve that, you won't be able to fly when it's highly dense. So, yeah, if you're looking at the current set of UASs, things are bad. But if you're looking at what will we require as we go beyond visual line of sight, I think we can specify levels of accuracy that can be built to. And that's why it's got to be performance-based. So I am more than happy to believe in a cooperative system because controllers would never be able to pick out anything at that scale. If you the, the argument about AIM says it's sloppy on the edges for small drones. It's really precise for controllers. Think about that. Thank you. Well, not, not passionate at all. I apologize. While, while you're here, I have another question for you, Steve, before I move to the next one. Uh, it's how UTM through Federated USS manages common traffic situational awareness. Is there a central traffic monitoring and information system envisage, maybe as part of an inter-USS platform or another centralized entity? 
<clears throat> so I, I've, I saw two versions today, and both versions are valid. We have a centralized, you have a centralized platform that has the, is the sharer of the tracking information. And I saw that in some of the, the use space. Or, and we've demonstrated this, you can have a federated system in which all those who are providing this service are qualified and they have to share the information with each other. So they both, they both are viable. The one with a central is one choice. The other one is where to participate as a USS, you have to be able to show you have this capability, is also viable, and that's the way we're going. So that it's all federated, it doesn't require a central, a central database. Thank you. Peter, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I want to add to this to this discussion because when, when I uh, um, uh, entered the, the Gulf of Finland project, my, one of my key concerns really was how do I c keep this this safe? How, how do we ensure that we know where all our devices are and how do we ensure that we know where everybody else is? Um, we were operating in, in, in a very close vicinity with the devices that we had for ourselves. And on top of that, uh, operating on an open airfield and so on in a control zone. So my key concern really was how to get this this safe. And and this is really why we said what we will set up uh, a central uh, a central service. Um, and uh, the the issues that I, I I potentially see, and you may have more experience on that one. But the issues that I potentially see on on a distributed approach is that um, it takes time to propagate the information. Um, and then uh, we will have to consider how much separation do we actually want to require um, for um, uh, for that uh, operates uh, for this uh, space to be operable, uh, and and network contributes to that. Um, data processing time uh, contributes to that. To that, and there's a number of other factors. Um, some of them are, we already have seen in the Gulf of Finland project. So um, my question really is that the, the, the hard coin of uh, of that, that, that we, the, the hard currency that we really have here is surveillance information. Um, we currently rely on secondary information. That's fine, and it will probably work in the vast majority of the airspaces. Um, but how quickly do, do we have to go it through, uh, get it through, in order to have a real, uh, complete uh, situation uh, picture? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I think that'll work better on a central service. But okay. So, so yeah, go we're, ahead. we're not here. To, we're not here to, to no, debate. No, let's try to keep it short. Debate UTM. <laughs> However, I, I think that one of the points you brought up earlier about the use of a flight plan as intent is absolutely true. A flight plan is not intent, even in the manned system. A flight plan is a sketch of what you want to do, and then you get clearances for more detailed. Part, the heart and soul of the UTM system as we describe it is the, the, the flight intent, the airspace reservation, the strategic conflict uh, management, in which I do have detailed information about where that vehicle is going to be in each moment of time, and I can strategically deconflict. You, you, what you describe as a, as a system which is more like today in manned aircraft, where you do ad hoc interventions based on surveillance, surveillance here should be a validation of the intent, and the intent has to be very detailed for this to actually work. Because uh, ad hoc interventions, I don't think will scale, but I, I, I apologize again. <laughs> yeah, I think we will follow okay. on this later on. Yeah, okay. Let, let's let's. I suggest you do that offline and maybe use the receptions afterwards for for the discussions. So since it's already uh, almost five, I'll take one more question, and it's uh, for you, Peter and Maria, and hopefully it's a short answer. So the question is for how long, how in fact in bracket how many years you know should the data of the flight plan be recorded? Any ideas? Say again, please, how much time the flight how, plan... How be... long should the data of the flight plan be recorded? We should a legal requirement for basically... If, if I would answer as I can, I should probably say 30 days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's extremely um, uh, depending on, on, on local regulation at this moment, I believe. Um, uh, if, if we're considering, um, if we were to, to adhere to ICAO rules, I would say it would be 30 days a minimum. Okay, so thank you very much. You know, there were a couple of more questions, but since you know it's already five o'clock, I think you know we had the long first day. So I'd like you know again a, a good round of applause for the uh, our speakers. So this is now the end of the sessions for day one. 
and there will be an evening reception which is sponsored by the Boeing company and that will begin shortly. But however, prior to the reception, we would like kindly request you know, that you remain seated as Mrs. Mildred Trogler from the Boeing company will provide a brief presentation. Please welcome Mildred to the podium. Good evening. I'm standing between uh, you and drinks, so I will be very short. I promise this to you. Um, so first of all, I would like to take the opportunity to thank IKEO for doing such a wonderful job to hosting this event. Um, I think we would all agree that this is a really valuable platform for constructive discussion. We're very much looking forward to also continuing the dialogue over the next two days. Talking a bit about Boeing, we recently turned 103 years young, and our re history has really paralleled the history of aviation. With this comes a certain responsibility. So we also need to look into the next 100 years of aviation and make up our mind of what Boeing, what role Boeing will like to play. In this spirit, we have established a new business division called Boeing Next, and we are in charge of building the future of urban, global, and regional mobility. So we really believe that the safe and reliable mobility transformation does not occur just through building a vehicle. So it's different from traditional aviation. There's a strong focus also on creating a safe ecosystem around it. So we as Boeing Next really work across the enterprise and with external stakeholders to make this vision a reality. And we believe that creating the safe ecosystem requires new technologies in autonomy, proportion connectivity, security and data management, but it also requires to really engage with local authorities, environmentalists, and planners on developing the necessary infrastructure. And this is really challenging and it will take time. Nobody can do this alone. I think this is another point I think we would all agree upon. And this is where history starts to repeat itself. Like in the 1950s, we have built a wonderful airplane called the 707, which fundamentally transformed transportation around the world. But it was not the airplane itself that was really driving this transformation. It was more the ecosystem that established around the platform. And I think we see the same thing happening right now here with the introduction of these new technology. There is no single asset or element that you can introduce in isolation. It wouldn't work. It's really an ecosystem of capability. From a regulatory perspective, this really also requires that we look at an integrated approach across certification, flight standards, but also airspace integration to guarantee the safety across the ecosystem. So safety always comes first. And achieving safety is more than just sound design. It really requires safety assurance across the entire life cycle ranging from building and certifying the aircraft, but also managing the airspace and in ensuring predictive and reliable maintenance. And of course, as I mentioned, the design and development of the infrastructure around it. But this, and this is where we need to refer back to traditional aviation, it also requires a safety culture. I feel sometimes we are not talking sufficiently about this important aspect. Um, if I refer back to our panel and the dinner we were talking about during the panel, we also had a lengthy discussion just about the just culture aspect related to these new emerging technologies and the opportunity we have there just to look also at traditional aviation. So introducing these new technology won't happen overnight. Only proven technology will be phased in who went through a robust development and testing process. And we have recently designed and performed a number of test flights. Let me start with a couple of success stories. So earlier this year, Aurora Flight Sciences were flying the passenger air vehicle successfully. And we have also built, designed, and uh, tested our cargo air vehicle. 
The focus on cargo logistics first is key as it enables the industry and regulators to prove out the safety case and really to unlock the regulatory requirements necessary to enable new UAS solution. And this is also why a company like Boeing looks at the full range of vehicles. We are also partnering with a company called Kitty Hawk Cora because they are very experienced in the operation. They already have an experimental airworthiness certificate from the New Zealand CAA. And we are continuing to leverage and share learnings from across all of these platforms. We have also invested and in working closely with many startups, one of which is Spark Cognition, an Austin-based leading AI company, and we are building the first blockchain-based aerial operating system. But what role does IKEO really play here? So industry had made significant progress in further advancing the aircraft concept. But I think the really challenging piece we are looking at is the safe integration into the airspace. And another challenge here is we cannot really develop the vehicle in isolation of addressing those aspects related to the safe integration. The two are tightly coupled and go hand in hand. Two years ago, the IKO ARPAS panel released the CONOPS document for international IFR operation. And I think we have come a long way since then. And I'm very impressed um, following IKEA developments for almost a decade now of how fast IKEA is moving in this area. Now we are facing the situation of needing to redefine what successful integration actually is going to look like as the airspace environment we need to integrate in is constantly changing. So we now envisage in the not too distant future not only that ARPAs and drones will, will appear in the civil airspace, but as I mentioned earlier today, we are also looking at hypersonic, supersonic, and at one point um, also <clears throat> space vehicles. So the elephant we are setting out to eat has changed. And therefore, I think we need to take a more holistic operational concept. We need to have a more holistic definition of our future airspace environment and the operational concept. Once that goes just beyond the integration of ARPAs into the airspace. And this is where I think IKEO can play an important role to steer and lead this discussion. With such a more holistic operational concept, we can achieve more system-wide safety, efficiency and sustainability. And this, I think, would be another milestone for us we should be looking at. This revised future airspace operational concept would also provide a common context for all the ongoing IKEA work that's done right now. So whereas I'm very impressed kind of how many working groups and panels are ultimately dealing with the problems we are discussing today, I think there is probably also more of a need to give them more concrete guidance. And this guidance actually needs to come from us as industry. Even more importantly, global consensus on a refined airspace operational concept can provide the basis for more comprehensive assessment and management of system-wide safety. And as I said, safety always comes first. So that's another important aspect to consider. Pragmatically, this needs to be accompanied by a roadmap, which clearly defines the airspace integration objectives, the enabling enhancement of the ATM system, airspace design, procedures, performance-based standards for separation, communication, navigation, and surveillance across all airspace users. Another point we touched upon today is the need for a more integrated air traffic management system. And what we have seen um, over the past 12 months is really that there are various UTM and how we call it in Europe, use based concepts emerging. And the IKEO UAS advisory group has recently updated their UTM guidance paper. And I think it's important that IKEO also here encourages member states to realign towards global interoperability. 
So what's interesting though, this ICAO UTM guidance paper calls for more participation from industry and government. And I think today is a testimony to the industry ongoing commitment to support this effort. And it's really great to see how many people made the long way to come to Montreal to support this event. So the future is closer than we think, and I think it's important to continue the dialogue. But also with respect to air traffic management, to not forget that if we look at the future, if we look at concepts like UTM and U-Space, they are also a way to address existing problems. And we need to further explore the opportunities a digitized and automated air traffic management system can have in advancing aviation safety management more broadly. So IKEA continues to play an essential role in the realization of this future air transportation ecosystem. And I think we all as industry are recognizing their role to facilitate improved cooperation, collaboration, and best practices. Great work is being done. And I think we need their global leadership to drive towards a unified airspace operational concept and regulatory framework. But I think it also needs the commitment from us industry and the government to provide the, the necessary resources to actually support ICAO in their leadership role. Boeing is proud to be a platinum sponsor of this event, and uh, we're very much looking forward to continue the discussion over the next two years. And with this, I would like to invite you to join us for the reception. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wim Mildred, for your presentation. And uh, thank you again to the Boeing Company for sponsoring this evening's reception. I would like to thank also all of you, the audience, as well as uh, those watching online for their participation, as well as all of today's speakers and moderators. Please join me for a well-deserved round of applause. In closing, we will see you again tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. for the start of day two, which will focus on this year's RFI UTM problem statements. Have a good evening and enjoy the reception. Thank you.